such another destruction of mantle ornaments and toilet bottles as the earthquake created, San Francisco never saw before. There was hardly a girl or a matron in the city but suffered losses of this kind. Suspended pictures were thrown down, but oftener still by a curious freak of the earthquake's humor. They were whirled completely around with their faces to the wall. There was great difference of opinion at first as to the course or direction the earthquake traveled but water that splashed out of various tanks and buckets settled that. Thousands of people were made so seasick by the rolling and pitching of floors and streets that they were weak and bedridden for hours, and some few for even days afterward. Hardly an individual escaped nausea entirely. The queer earthquake episodes that form the staple of San Francisco gossip for the next week would fill a much larger book than this, and so I will diverge from the subject. By and by, in the due course of things, I picked up a copy of the Enterprise one day and fell under this cruel blow. Nevada Mines, New York. G.M. Marshall, Sheba Hurst, and Amos H. Rose, who left San Francisco last July for New York City, with ores from mines in Pinewood District, Humboldt County, and on the Reese River Range, have disposed of a mine containing 6,000 feet and called the Pine Mountains Consolidated for the sum of $300,000. The stamps on the deed, which is now on its way to Humboldt County from New York, for a record amount of $3,000, which is said to be the largest amount of stamps ever placed on one document. A working capital of $100,000 has been paid into the treasury, and machinery has already been purchased for a large quartz mill, which will be put up as soon as possible. The stock in this company is all full paid and entirely unassailable. The ores of the mines in this district somewhat resemble those of the Sheba mine in Humboldt. Sheba Hurst, the discoverer of the mines with his friends, corralled all the best leads and all the land and, and timber they desired before making public their whereabouts. Ores from their estate in this city showed them to be exceedingly rich in silver and gold, silver predominating. There is an abundance of wood and water in the district. We are glad to know that New York capital has been enlisted in the development of the mines of this region. Having seen the ores and assays, we are satisfied that the miners of the district that the mines of the district are very valuable, anything but wildcat. Once more, native imbecility had carried the day, and I had lost a million. It was the blind lead over again. Let us not dwell on this miserable matter. If I were inventing these things, I could be wonderfully humorous over them, but they are too true to be talked of with hearty levity, even at this distant day. True, and yet not exactly as given in the above figures, possibly. I saw Marshall months afterward, and although he had plenty of money, he did not claim to have captured an entire million. In fact, I gathered that he had not received 50,000. Beyond that figure, his fortune appeared to consist of uncertain vast expectations rather than prodigious certainties. However, when the above item appeared in print, I put full faith in it, and incontinently wilted and went to seed under it. Suffice it that I so lost heart and so yielded myself up to, to repinings and sighings and foolish regrets that I neglected my duties and became about worthless as a reporter for a brisk newspaper. And at last one of the proprietors took me aside with a charity I still remember with considerable, considerable respect and gave me an opportunity to resign my birth and so save myself the disgrace of a dismissal. Chapter 59 Poor Again Slinking as a Business A Model Collector Misery Loves Company Comparing Notes for Comfort A Streak of Luck Finding a Dime Wealthy by Comparison 
two sumptuous dinners. For a time, I wrote literary screeds for the golden era. C.H. Webb had established a very excellent literary weekly called The Californian. But high merit was no guarantee of success. It languished, and he sold out to three printers, and Bret Hart became editor at $20 a week, and I was employed to contribute an article a week at $12. But the journal still languished, and the printers sold out to Captain Ogden, a rich man and a pleasant gentleman, who chose to amuse himself with such an expensive luxury without much caring about the cost of it. When he grew tired of the novelty, he resold to the printers. The paper presently died a peaceful death, and I was out of work again. I would not mention these things, but for the fact that they so aptly illustrate the ups and downs that characterize life on the Pacific coast. A man could hardly stumble into such a variety of queer vicissitudes in any other country. For two months, my sole occupation was avoiding acquaintances, for during that time I did not earn a penny, or buy an article of any kind, or pay my board. I became very adept at slinking. I slunk from back street to back street. I slunk away from approaching faces that looked familiar. I slunk to my meals, ate them humbly, and with a mute apology for every mouthful I robbed my generous landlady out. And at midnight, after wanderings that were but slinkings away from cheerfulness and light, I slunk into my bed. I felt meaner and lowlier and more despicable than the worms. During all this time I had but one piece of money, a silver ten-cent piece, and I held to it and would not spend it on any account least the consciousness coming strong upon me that I was entirely penniless might suggest suicide. I had pawned everything but the clothes I had on, so I clung to my dime desperately till it was smooth with, with handling. However, I am forgetting. I did have one other occupation besides that of slinking. It was the entertaining of a collector and being entertained by him who had in his hands the Virginia's banker's bill for the $46 which I had loaned to my schoolmate, the prodigal. This man used to call regularly once a week and dun me, and sometimes oftener. He did it from sheer force of habit, for he knew he could get nothing. He could get out his bill, calculate the interest for me at 5% a month, and show me clearly that there was no attempt at fraud in it, and no mistakes, and then plead and argue and done with all his might for any sum, any little trifle, even a dollar, even half a dollar, on account. This, then, his duty was accomplished and his conscience free. He immediately dropped the subject there always, got out a couple of cigars and divided, put his feet in the window, and then we would have a long, luxurious talk about everything and everybody, and he would furnish me with a, a world of curious, dunning adventures out of the ample store in his memory. By and by, he would clap his hat on his head, shake hands, and say briskly, Well, business is business. Can't stay with you always, and was off in a second. The idea of pining for a dun, and yet I used to long for him to come and would get as uneasy as any mother if the day went by without his visit when I was expecting him. But he never collected that bill, or at least not any part of it, at last, at last nor any part of it. I lived to pay it to the banker myself. Misery loves company. Now and then at night, in out of the way, dimly lighted places, I found myself happening on another child of misfortune. He looked so seedy and forlorn, so homeless and friendless and forsaken, that I yarned toward him as a brother. I wanted to claim kinship with him and go about and enjoy our wretchedness together. The drawing toward each other must have been mutual. At any rate, we got to falling together oftener, though still seemingly by accident. And although we did not speak or evince any recognition, I think the dull anxiety passed out of both of us when we saw each other, and then for several hours we would idle along contentedly, wide apart, and glancing fruitively in at home lights and fireside gatherings out of the night shadows and very much enjoying our dumb companionship. 
Finally we spoke and were inseparable after that, for our woes were identical almost. He had been a reporter too and lost his birth, and this was his experience, as nearly as I can collect it. After losing his birth he had gone down, 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 with never a halt, from a boarding house on Russian Hill to a boarding house in Kearney Street, from thence, thence to DuPont, from thence to a low sailor den, and from thence to lodgings and goods boxes and empty hogsheads near the wharves. Then for a while he had gained a meager living by sewing up bursted sacks of grain on the piers. When that failed, he had found food here, and there as chance threw it in his way. He had ceased to show his face in daylight now, for a reporter knows everybody, rich and poor, high and low, and cannot well avoid familiar faces in the broad light of day. This mendicant, Blucher, I call him for that for convenience, was a splendid creature. He was full of hope, pluck, and philosophy. He was well-read and a man of cultivated taste. He had a bright wit and was a master of satire. His kindliness and his generous spirit made him royal in my eyes and changed his curbstone seat to a throne and his damaged hat to a crown. He had an adventure once which sticks fast in my memory as the most pleasantly grotesque that ever touched my sympathies. He had been without a penny for two months. He had shirked about obscure streets among friendly dim lights till the thing had become second nature to him. But at last he was driven abroad in daylight. The cause was sufficient. He had not tasted food for 48 hours, and he could not endure the misery of his hunger in idle hiding. He came along a back street, glowering at the loaves and bake shop windows, and feeling that he could trade his life away for a morsel to eat. The sight of the bread doubled his hunger, but it was good to look at it anyhow and imagine one, what one might do if one only had it. Presently in the middle of the street he saw a shining spot, looked again, did not, and could not believe his eyes, turned away to try them, then looked again. It was a variety, no vain hunger and a verity, no vain hunger inspired delusion. It was a silver dime. He snatched it, gloated over it, doubled it, bit it, found it genuine, choked his heart down, and smothered a hallelujah. Then he looked around, saw that nobody was looking at him, threw the dime down where it was before, walked away a few steps, and approached again, pretending he did not know it was there, so that he could re-enjoy the luxury of finding it. He walked around it, viewing it from different points, then sauntered about with his hands in his pockets, looking up at the signs and now and then glancing at it and feeling the old thrill again. Finally, he took it up and went away, fondling it in his pocket. He idled through unfrequented streets, stopping in doorways and corners to take it out and look at it. By and by, he went home to his lodgings, an empty Queensware hogshead, hogshed, and employed himself till night trying to make up his mind what to buy with it, but it was hard to do. To the get the most for it was the idea. He knew that at the miner's restaurant he could get a plate of beans and a piece of bread for ten cents, or a fish ball and some few trifles, but they gave no bread with one fish ball there. At French Pete's he could get a veal cutlet, plain, and some radishes and bread for ten cents, or a cup of coffee, a pint at least, and a slice of bread, 